better put my phone on silent. That might help. I don't want to. I don't want that going off midstream. It has happened before. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, okay. Looks like the live is kicking off. Just need to kill off the the, the doctor here. Okay, we're live. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Danielle, Tyson, everyone else tuning in. There's a whole bunch of people live right now with us. This is great. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the SMWS Australia, the Scotch Pot Whiskey Society, Australian branch daily live stream. My name is Matt Bailey. I'm the National Ambassador for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society here. I really appreciate you all tuning in and being a part of this every night that we go live, which is every night. Um, some nights, however, it's not just me talking um, good things whiskey. Sometimes I'm uh, blessed to have the presence of some special guests, and and uh, tonight is no exception to the rule. Of course, I'd like to um, formally introduce, of course, Tom Scott, Joey Ty, two absolute legends of the whiskey scene. They're right here with, with us tonight. So um, thank you guys for joining in. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us, bro. Nice to see you. It is a pleasure to see your face. <laughs> it is a pleasure to see your happy face. <laughs> what more stands in the flesh? <laughs> uh, John Buffard, Irina, Ben, Toro Suzuki, Yao Wong. Good to see you all tuning in. Thank you so much for being a part of it tonight. Uh, I'd like to start off by actually providing some context for SMWS members, for those who like to watch in each night. Otherwise, um, tell us who you are. Tell us, give us some background about what this is all about, what, what your journey in whiskey looks like. So, and what you you could start with what you're doing even right now, like what's what's going on. Ladies first. Ladies yeah, no, Joey, you're you're up, you're up. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you, Matt Bailey, for having us. Of course. Well, we we had a pretty amazing um, the porter bartender sort of um, quiz earlier, and then we get into this um, tasty, tasty whiskey tasting. And um, look, for me personally, I'm not doing much, but I'm freelancing at the moment. So help some people make some cocktails and try to, you know, keep my games on about whiskey tasting and stuff. So yeah, just try to stay connected and, you know. You're freelancing at the moment, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, give, the, I'm gonna give the audience a quick bit of context on you here for a moment. <laughs> we first ran into each other uh, and you were at the Kilburn. So we're going back a little bit yeah, here. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> And that was fantastic. That was, of course, back when the Kilburn was a society partner bar as well. Um, yeah, it was a uh, one of the society partner bar in Hawthorn, one of the regional suburbs in Melbourne. And uh, yeah, you was amazing. And then it was really cool. We can host like a lot of members as well for tasting. So it was pretty cool. It was, Jesus, four years ago. Yeah. Of course. Was, um, yeah, one of the destination whiskey bar in Melbourne suburb, I have to say. Yeah, I mean, were you also part of Baronel's Lounge before it became Kilburn and all that? No, I wasn't. I wasn't. But then I was part of the Baronel's and Borium distribution after the Kilburn bar. So yeah, still doing probably, yeah. whiskey stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, Tom, give us give us the rundown. Now, I know you as, as Happy Face. That's my favorite nickname for you. Uh, <laughs> or um, or uh, Robot Tender. But yeah. <laughs> I'm learning emotions. <laughs> <laughs> One day at a time. No, no, I'm just kidding. But um, you're, um, you and I first connected when you were at uh, Whiskey and Ailment, uh, one of our premium partner bars over in Melbourne. Yeah, yeah. So I guess my whiskey journey starts a long, long time ago. Uh, my dad was always a whiskey drinker, mainly drinking Irish whiskey. And I, like every good Australian south of the Queensland border, became a bourbon drinker. Uh, I'll, I'll say of legal how, drinking how age. How old were you when you start drinking bourbon? Legal drinking age, sure. Mm. Let's go with that. <laughs> yeah, you were, you were 18 in one day. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good. Definitely. Uh, Thanks, love so, us right now. Thank you so much. Whiskey of, of its forms was always uh, one of my things. And when I started in the cocktail bartending world, especially a place like Man in Brussels, I quickly sort of realized I need to know all the different spirits on the back bar. And when I went through that journey of discovering between gin and rum and brandy, whiskey was the shining light, uh, in particular Scottish single malts, led to me starting to run my own whiskey classes and try to learn as much as I can. Uh, Brooke and Julian at the time when they had their venue, Chez Regime, they actually tried to recruit me to turn it into whiskey now, but I took a different job instead to go live over in Paris because it's hard to say no to France. 
Uh, and I was fortunate enough to then work for as the head bartender of one of the premium cocktail bar groups over there, the Experimental Cocktail Club, where I had access to hundreds of Japanese whiskey. It was ridiculous. I think one of the bars I worked in, we had about 60 something variations of just nickel whiskey alone. Uh, then when I returned, my whiskey love didn't stop and eventually Brooke and Julian managed to get me into the fold and I spent a bit over two years being the Benny Major at Whiskey Endowment, enjoying the luxury of having about a thousand whiskeys on the back bar and another 400 in the archive that I, the archive that I could sneak into and steal from <laughs> to uh, select the new whiskeys of the week. And yeah, and that's when we ran into each other. Uh, yeah. It's also where Joy and I rekindled <laughs> our, union. Our, our friendship. We, we, we'd known each other for, well, it's been about 12 years now. Yeah, more than that. Maybe. Through the industry, but Whiskey Now is where the, uh, the the dating started and then the relationship started and then the engagement happened. I was only going to say that the Whiskey Reunion started, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, awesome. So, uh, you, yes, so Tom, so it's definitely a, a cocktail background for you, though, is, is really sort of where it, it began in, in explore, exploration of flavours in that way. Yeah, definitely. Uh, cocktails and then just whiskey and then whiskey slowly took over from the cocktail side of things and, and led to me to the job I now have today as brand ambassador with the exchange and Beam Suntory, which looks after most of the portfolio is whiskey. So it makes me happy. And as you said, just before we went live, you you get to look, you're, that means you get to look after the likes of Lafroy, Bamor, and a few, uh, name a few others for us. Uh, Ardmore, Connemara, Tim McConnell, uh, Maker's Mark, Ockentoshin, yeah, some, some great whiskeys from around the world. Also, obviously, the Japanese range of Suntory. So. Yeah, amazing. And so that includes the Yamazaki and Hibiki and all those kind of brands as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When we Let can me get do it. it for you, baby. <laughs> when, when you can get it. Yeah, exactly. So Because obviously, supply is always very short on that stuff. Um, Marcus Mottram says, such a good looking bunch. Thank you, Marcus. Um, love you back, mate. Um, Definitely talking about you, Matt. Sure. <laughs> I'll take that. And this is background sounds whilst I'm cooking, says Yao. Thanks, Yao. <laughs> Yao, how are we doing? <laughs> um, so one of the things we want to touch on tonight, um, which might tie into some of your journey in whiskey uh, and and how you've approached it, and what we, were sort of, we sort of bounced some ideas around about talking about vintages and talking about sort of, I guess that could tie into age statements and history of some whiskey as well. So do you want to kick us off there, Tom? What was, where was that? Where does that kick in for you? Uh, well, I guess with both Joey and I, it's a bit of a different journey. When, when talking about vintages, you can almost talk about your journey through whiskey. Some of, some of the, the whiskeys we've had throughout our time and how distilleries change. And um, we want to talk about vintages. Um, what, one thing that I'm always interested about is, and I, I guess to take my job aside, is the amount of times ambassadors or representatives of distilleries will talk about how a whiskey still keeps the same recipe, has been making it the same way for 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, whatever they like to say. And a lot of the time it's absolute rubbish because when we look at vintage whiskies, when we're looking at, say, we want to look at brands that I have or brands that anyone else has that's been around since the 1800s, there's a reason why we can try the variants of it from the 90s and the 80s and the 70s and the 60s and each one of them tastes different. So that's what I always like about when companies are saying that, oh yeah, we've kept the same recipe. Well, why has it changed different, taste different from decade to decade? And a lot of the production, uh, that sort of leads into a lot of the production changes that have happened and even uh, forced or uh, not even forced in some ways in like the the way they've, these distilleries have changed over time is quite fascinating. And I think sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worst, but in, in all the times, it's always it's always a change. And we've always seen that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and and as, as you kind of mentioned, sometimes it's equipment change, sometimes it's just technology changes. So while the recipe might not change, there is so many things that can affect what's going on. Like you look at Ardmore as an example, one of the last to change from uh, direct fire distillation. As part of technology changing, they've gone to steam coils and have had to put kinks into the steam coils to still replicate that burning hot spot to create the same style of whiskey they've been doing for ages. So technology changes, you have to adapt to it. Does it mean you're still making the same whiskey? What does that mean for that vintage, so to speak? Yeah, and, and um, obviously that sort of ties into also when you see distilleries expand and they and they have to get a new set of stills and they want that set of, the new set of stills to look um, at the shape and everything to be exactly as the old set often. Because because they don't want it to, they don't want to change the recipe. That would be that would be murderous. They want to they want to expand on the recipe. 
yeah, and there are the classic old stories of when the, the horse and cart bumped into the still and put a dint in there. And then every time they've got a new still, they bang in that same old dint because of how much it affects the product. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it, it's funny you mentioned Ardmore actually, because that came up in discussion in our last Friday's uh, live stream when uh, Seamus Carroll from Brown Foreman actually referenced the distillery because it was actually, it was, it was Ardmore, Glendronach and Springbank with the, Sort of the, I think they were the, actually the last three uh, to move away from coal fired uh, stills. And coal fired still distillate, it, that's uh, uh, the reason why, I mean, referencing that one in particular is quite a different, uh, is quite a different spirit from direct fire or steam. Yeah, you're going to get huge different flavors. Like, I'm not sure what you've experienced with going, like trying distillates or from the same distillery of when it's changed from coal fired to steam or heat jackets. And- Absolutely. Well, um, I have to say, you know, when I first get involved or like learn about Singapore whiskey as a bartender, it was from like the distributors, 100%. And then back in the day, I, I'm speaking probably 2008, it's like very, very early stage. You know, back in the day, it's not many whiskeys involved. Like, even Australia is very hard to get a rye whiskey coming to the country. So we only have what Britain House rye was the only one ever. That's nothing else. So I think um, when I first very learned that single malt whiskey is um, people actually coming back, they are from Australia or New Zealand. They, they're coming back after working in the UK, in Scotland or whatnot, and bring back, hey guys, we learn all this whiskey. You know, there's people that are distributing this in Australia. Let's put in this um, range of Gunnarhaven, Macallan, you know, back in the day, it's very limited. And people from Australia only learn the thing about whiskey by the region, when bar only can actually you know, order things very limited. So we will have a couple of the Macallan 12 or 18. They are totally different flavor profile. And then you get um, Brunehaven, maybe 12 and 10 as well. And then also a couple of the Lafoy and uh, yeah, Bonbon, yeah. that's it. So the, the resources and materials that from a bartender perspective to learn about single whiskey were pretty limited. First, you explain the, the industry was limited about consuming, you know, different um, variety of the whiskey. But you learn from that, you like back from the UK, from the distillery. Oh, we may have lost a, oh, just checking connection here. That's how I learned. Uh, just having a bit of connectivity yeah. issues, sorry. So uh, folks, I think we're having some connectivity issues here, so just bear with us a moment. Um, we'll see if we can get Tom and um, Joey back in the stream any moment now. Um, I think we've, they've just dropped out a bit there. Um, I'm going to try and bring them back in because uh, obviously that would be most ideal scenario. Uh, bear with me here a moment. Um, in the meantime, I'd love to I'd love to see in the comments uh, what you're drowning on. Honestly, like there's there's so much good whiskey out there at the moment, and and there's so many people enjoying uh, some. I even saw some um, some big swell and cigar from Zeno before that looked pretty cool. Um, Um, see what the, how these guys are going along here. Uh, like I said, just um, mm, well, uh, I'm gonna Sam. I'm gonna ask Sam to Sam Dunn. I'm gonna ask those questions as soon as I get them back in on the stream here. Um, here they are. Here they are. Ah, oh, I think we got them back. I think we got them back. Yeah. Sorry, the joys of the internet at the moment when the whole world's trying to use it at once. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're seeing it. Um, so if you, if they do drop out, folks, we'll just we'll jump back in with them. Um, so, okay, so uh, Joey, I think we caught a lot of what you're saying there, and it's there's a line that our seller master Andrew um, 
often says he used to well he, he he still says it from time to time is that he reckons the whole whiskey scene in terms of perception and how and and selection changes every six months so if you look at if you look at a 10-year period if you look at what what it looked like on the shelf in australia 10 years ago it's a totally different beast from what it is today absolutely absolutely you know back in the day when i sorry when i first learned how have that cinema whiskey my mentor or bar manager we talked me from region by region but mm. nowadays what we want to deliver to our consumer is like what is in the bottle you know still deliver the, the distillery story but it's not about the the age of the numbers not about the region of the whiskey is purely about the flavor profile well i think, so, I think 90s i think 90s whiskey marketing has a lot to answer for because there's, so, <laughs> there's this there was a long perception to do with um age statements it, you know, like age statements were were yeah, were every. We still in... Sorry, you go. No, I was just saying, like there was there was that perception in the nineties that age statement was the most important part of the product. Absolutely, because that was what is available. That was, you know, Sangamon whiskey wasn't that popular, you know, no, back in no. I would say ten years ago. Like the blender was the winner because it's easier to consume and it's you know reasonable price and is you know it making great process for single mode distillery making great juice and continue to making blending yeah but then when you find it more is like from independent bottler bringing exceptional cast and bottling and people actually get a taste of things that you don't ever really taste it from from a shop or distillery easily can get a whiskey from then it's like asking question and you will know, okay, where is this from? You know, is it a blend or it's not? It's single cast and, you know, it's all started. Yeah, I think when you're talking about like the age statement stuff that came about in the 90s and how that marketing came about and, and the craze it led to and obviously the issues you now have to deal with today of trying to rewind all that marketing, uh, especially at the time, you know, American whiskeys were never really promoting how old they were because no bourbon's going to talk about how they're aged four to six years because it's not really a glorious number. You look at other aged uh, products at the time, I guess you can look at cognacs, but again, they're using XO statements and BS statements, not really using age statements, so to speak. So I, I guess it it was one thing the Scottish whiskey industry could do that while it was going through the down patch could differentiate itself from the rest of the, the spirit market was to go, well, we're aged for 10, 15, 20 years, which was something that not many other people could claim. The only other ones that could claim it were really the cognac industry, but they didn't really do it that way. So. And they never have. Even now, they still don't. Yeah, like, like the only ones kind of Armagnacs that give you vintages, but yep. not really aged. So. And the funny thing about Armagnac is that even, uh, well, I mean, this, is, this leans into, into heavy subjectivity, but I find that even some of the youngest uh, some of the younger Armagnacs actually perform uh, far better than some of the truly old ones. And I've, I've seen some very disappointing 1940s and 1950s Armagnacs before, and I've tasted some extraordinary 2013 and 2014 Armagnacs as an example. Yeah. And, and Armagnacs are one of those sort of forgotten gems that are half the price often than a cognac and twice as good. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, it is. Um, well, it, that's because it doesn't come in giant crystal decanter bottles that... <laughs> Uh, so it's fine. It's it's still it's still good good spirit. They're not spending all that money on glass. Uh, there was a question here from uh, from Sam Dunn, uh, all the way over from WA. Uh, so he says, uh, Tom, how, uh, there have been changes in barley varietals. Have has there been much improvement in maize varietals for creation of bourbons? And uh, he also, and which is a follow on question where he says uh, to everyone in this, uh, Joey, Tom, and myself, uh, what's your favorite bourbon at the moment? <laughs> uh, when it comes to maize varietals, yes, there have been changes throughout the years. Um, and I was actually just chatting with a good friend of mine, Shay, about this the other day about changing from corn glucose with some of it. Um, it gets to an area that I'm not a huge expert on in terms of the change of grain styles they've used. But yes, it has changed the same as the, uh, the barley grain has changed throughout slowest distillation to be more efficient, to get a higher yield the exact aspect and science behind what they've changed, I couldn't really get into you for. Mm. Uh, in terms of favourite bourbon at the moment? Oh. It's hard to say. <laughs> to, to be honest, I've actually been enjoying a bit of rye whiskey at the moment. The Knob Creek rye has been uh, 
my, my whiskey at home of, of late. Uh, that or I do fortunately have a bottle of Rob Samuel's Maker's Mark Private Select that I've been Course. getting through a bit faster than I probably should. <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, I, I always uh, um, a rye fan, but for a bourbon whiskey, I think my constant favorite is always Buffalo Trace. It just yeah, right. consistent and make, I'm banging the hatch in old fashioned, just get the depth and body of it. Like, yeah, okay. amazing. yeah, 100% Buffalo Trace for me. I'm kind of, um, I'm, I'm kind of a bit on Tom's camp on this. I've been sort of, I've been drink, I still love my bourbons, but I've actually opened more bottles of rye in the last few months than I normally would. Um, yeah. That, right. So I've, I've got a Knob Creek rye open. I've got a uh, Archie Rose rye. I've got a even the Gospel rye from your from the guys down there um, in Melbourne Melbourne Rob. Um, so there's a few things open on the shelf at the moment. But yeah, I mean, uh, I I think it's an interesting grain to work with, and it, it's it worked quite interesting in a, in terms of like it's in terms of the selection of mash bill among other things. Well, um, it, it's, it's- it's something that's come into populace of late because bourbon's been so dominant for so long. All these craft distillers coming in, they can't really come in with a bourbon and crack into the scene. Same as like uh, craft brewers can't come in with a lager because you're competing against the likes of Carlton Draft and Heineken and yada yada, and they come out with pale owls and IPAs and all that sort of stuff. So the craft whiskey scene in America has been leaning towards rise because that's where they can have their point of difference. It's also, if I'm being completely honest, I don't. I mean, you can't crack into that bourbon market very easily. Because you, you are going to be competing against the likes of Maker's Mark and Jim Beam and whatnot, um, but it's uh, at the same time, I, I just think that the craft rye, the interesting small distillery rye that we're seeing, is just far more interesting as a spirit than the craft bourbons we're seeing, which just to me tastes all a little bit underdone, a little bit sort of under oaked, a little bit sort of uh, quite all quite young. It's all that rush to market that we see even on local market as well sometimes. Yeah. It's it's a pretty standard thing globally with a lot of the young whiskey scenes. <laughs> oh yeah. So speaking of vintages, then I mean, going back to that discussion, for both of you, do you think that as we sort of as the explosion of distilleries around the world continues, we well, I don't mean literal explosion, but I mean explosion in popularities of whiskey as a spirit, but also the number of new distilleries popping up, not just obviously in Scotland, but also of course across Australia, across uh, America, all over the place. Do you think that that's going to drive uh, a, a movement back away from age statements even more so than we're seeing? Um, absolutely. I think, well, before we get to that, I think with the age statement is based on the evolution of, you know, how whiskey producer and also whiskey consumer are taking it at the moment. We all really focus on the flavor profile than the numbers of it. So absolutely, I think this is always going to cycle, you know, the distilleries or the marketing person from the distilleries always will be based on what is, you know, most selling and what is work. And at the same time, what you have with your resources and materials to make your products. And the consumer was just like, okay, this is the time that we don't focus on age statement anymore. We focus on flavor, but still focus on where is the whiskey come from? So I, I think this is a question is more po- like portfolio of the flavor from where it is. From so more country, about, so, so more, about provenance, more about provenance and, and mash bill rather than age statement. hundred percent, because at the same time, you can't constantly making the same juice you are making 20 years ago. You no. just don't have that enough, you know, and everyone know that. That's why when we have a crisis that we ran out of Japanese whiskey. Why? Because they were just have a pick of everyone want to buy it, but then they are still buying it without knowing the differences with, you know, the age statement or the non age statement one, as mm-hmm. long as it's come from Japan, they will buy it. So this yeah. is the mentality about the consumer. I, I think obviously we're seeing a trend away from age statements when it comes to official releases and your standard market releases. But what we all are, we're seeing at the same time is the consumer is a lot more educated than the consumer was five, 10, Absolutely. 15, 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. Like people, like the amount of independent whiskey is now available and the amount of whiskey bars that now offer great offerings or a uh, great range and, and customers that know what the hell they're actually talking about. And mm. bartenders and the hell they're talking about. So 
when it comes to the age statement stuff, I, th I think it's going to go a bit two ways. Yes, I, I still see your official releases, your standard market releases probably shying away from that because they've realized the trap that they got into doing that. But I think we'll see some of the indies and some of the more, uh, I guess, one-off releases from the official companies probably give you more information and probably looking at trying to give you as much age statement and casking and try and give you a bit more because they've realized the customer actually knows what the hell they're talking about now and has information. And when it comes to ages, we're now starting to realize that, you know, not necessarily older is better. Like we've known this for a while. Yeah. But the consumer is trying to understand that and, and even look at some, like there's been some Buna Harbin releases at four or five years old that are crackers mm. and try and convince um, the rest of the world that no, it doesn't have to be 10, 15, 20 years old to be a good whiskey it's still a still a standard common thing amongst people that they still believe older is better, but they're starting to learn the other side of it. I think what is people will be expecting to learn or like to know more is where is the whiskey come from and where is the whiskey come from, from the cask? So this is people are, what, what is the current consumer learning nowadays? Because there's so much more resources an opportunity for people to attend to whiskey tasting, online tasting, and you know, to research of where's the whiskey come from, what cars is go to, and what yeah. blend is going to. So I think um, at the end of the question is what make that particular range special or particular releases is special is how transparent is that whiskey is. You know. well, I mean, and I'm all for transparency. I mean, I, I mean, a society where as transparent as you can possibly get, and, and you know, we we love that, really? and it, we you know we love having an age statement on the bottle always, and telling you the date it was distilled, all that kind of stuff is important. Uh, I'll just I'm just going to ask a question of you both from the flip side of that argument in some ways, though, uh, and I like this part because there was there was an article written by Andrew Dervidge on Whiskey and Wisdom about uh, how much information on a whiskey is too much. And it's it sort of it wasn't really sort of posing a question about uh, you know if you know like if you have a label that says this was distilled at this distillery on this date okay sure and then it was housed in this warehouse on this rack on this number and it was and then this warehouse manager farted on it on this day I mean <laughs> how much information about the the history and the provenance of that spirit is actually useful to the consumer enjoying it. Well, I guess like you can have some of the information there and then the ability to find out more. Yeah. And like you look at, I know Shelter Point has been doing it where they've got the QR code and you can actually scan it and find out the exact paddock where the barley came from to make that whiskey. You can get a bit geeky and, and really dive into it if you want. So I think there's the, the option to give people a lot of information, but it doesn't have to be like in large, big, bold letters in the front taking up everything. Yeah, no, I agree. That. I agree with that. Um, there's a comment here from Adam Bowden, Adam Bowden, who says, what about Lark from Tassie? Uh, it rotted the hair off my chest, but wow. Uh, hugs to you guys. Uh, I like my smoky and peaty, but my kidneys may need a tad more time. I'd be kicking my ass. Having said that, I love my Bamore and Laphroaig, but you guys rock. Mate, Adam, I really appreciate that comment. <laughs> I hope you get the hairs back on your chest sometime. <laughs> also, just quickly, um, what, what are we, we drowning? Go well, look. We we sort of we jump straight into this. What are we drowning on? What have you What have you got in your glass? Yeah. What are you drinking we've, as well? We've just opened my whiskey and almonds juice boxes. We've got the SMWS ten point one eight eight. Ten point one eight eight. There we go. So that's a that's a lovely distillery. Ten, as uh, as Andrew said, we can't possibly divulge what distillery that is, but it's um no. no. So that was from the recent outturn. That was called New Acquaintance, I think ten dot eight eight. I it, I literally am being lazy because the outturn's right in front of me. Uh, yeah, new acquaintance, deep, rich and dried fruits, 62.5%. Is that part of the facial release? It is. That is one of the facial releases, yeah. yeah. The 24 bottles in the country, Whiskey and Element took one and, and juice bagged them up. There we go. Yeah. That was pretty popular. So that's a 14-year-old refill sherry butt from that distillery. Um, good oh, stuff. delicious. Good stuff, mate. Um, some comments coming in here. I don't want to miss them. Uh, okay, so Joel Rinaldi makes a, 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 a good comment here. I think a big part of it is knowing what age is good for that distillery. Ah, that's a really good point. So, uh, and he says here something which I, I know I've said before as well. He says, 
Kilhoman work at a great young age. Uh, sorry, Kilhoman is great at young ages, but uh, distilleries like Springbank work much better at, at older age. So, uh, what do you what do you guys think about that when it comes to um, uh, you know sort of distilleries working at different ages, uh, having their sweet spot? Well, yeah, correct, but also personal preference is always going to come into a bunch of this. Uh, for my mind, distilleries like the the one we're currently trying, ten point. 188, it also might come down to the type of spirit they're making. Like uh, th- this distillery, should I just say? Makes you, you, can say it, you can say it. I, yeah. You can say it. Yeah. Uh, so like, like Buna Harvin is great when it's young and peated, but it's also brilliant when it's old and unpeated. So they, they hit both realms, just depends what spirit they're making. Um, yeah, I would argue there are some distilleries that are much better <laughs> older than younger though. And yep. it's personal preference at the end of the day. Though. Absolutely. And I would say, how do you call it? Like, Kilhoman is my favorite, favorite Isla whiskey. And, but that style, it is, is a different than Punahaban style. You know what I mean? Like, it really depends on if you know that particular brand or distillery, what they wanted to deliver to you to taste. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that's important because, come on, like, Bomo is the oldest Isla whiskey distillery in Isla. They have produced fucking amazing dram. Like I have tasted, very lucky I was- um, Oldest operational. Um, sorry? What? Oldest operational <laughs> distillery. <laughs> I'm just nitpicking, sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry, the oldest operational Isla whiskey. And I've been there myself. And then um, the, uh, we are in May. So six months ago, almost six months ago, I was in Hong Kong, very, very own Hong Kong whiskey show. Um, Hong Kong whiskey now, January. Jesus Christ. They have like probably 30 exhibitors in that show. And then majority of the exhibitors are brokers. They are like literally whiskey yeah. brokers. They're collectors. They're not in the industry. So, but they are showcasing 20 different um, signatory dummy bottles of independent bottling. So I, I very lucky to get to work there. And I tasted a 1965 and a 1975 Bomo whiskey. Like I never tasted that in my life and they were phenomenal. It's mm. completely different than what Bomo whiskey are making right nowadays, but then Jesus Christ, it's amazing. Well, they, so that my is point is, it's gone through a lot of transition in their flavor and their and really, their, uh, their My profile. point is about vintages and you know, whiskeys come from evolution. You know, you, you're gonna have to think about what you know when they were making it, who were they making, and what what was the materials and resources they were having that in, back in the day, and compared to nowadays, people are consuming whiskeys. So. I, I can't say you can compare the older making vintage whiskey and nowadays making whiskey from the same distillery. I think Kilhoman is brilliant, it's awesome. They try to you know, bring back the tradition of Scottish farmer. They were the whiskey distiller. They farm and they make the whiskey from the barley they grow themselves. This is, this is the, the concept of it. So, they are still the youngest right now in Isla and they are making great whiskey. So you just have to take away all the boundaries and just purely looking at particular whiskey and really feel what you like and appreciate that. You can't just, you know, bring, oh, this is what Isla whiskey is supposed to be and put on the whole rest of the Isla whiskey distilleries. So I think which is, it's- Yeah, which is kind of what drives the whole discussion around uh, the importance or uh, or relevance of regionality in that respect then. Yeah, uh, and we have to appreciate that, reg- right? Regionality is broken down completely over the last uh, decade, especially when you're looking at, you know, there, there are now island distilleries not producing peated whiskey and there are now Speyside whiskey distilleries producing peated whiskey. Yeah. There are now like uh, all sorts of variants of styles coming from all the different Absolutely. regions. So that regionality is really breaking down quite a bit. Um, also to get back to what you were talking about in terms of those vintages and how a distillery can change over time. Like you talked about the more and we've talked about a few other distilleries. I always find vintage is kind of an interesting thing when it comes to whiskey production and whiskey quality. 
we can talk about wine vintages and when you're looking at great champagne houses or wine houses and they've got Absolutely. their vintage that's you know like the the Grange from 50 whatever it was and like that was just the perfect atmosphere climate and temperature to produce those great grapes that led to that wine that was amazing when it comes to the whiskey vintages well it's not necessarily the climate of the year it was made it's the climate of the preceding 20 years while it's been aging it's the the distiller that was there that made it it was the technology that they had at the time that's potentially changed since then and always always find it like a really interesting thing but also a little sad when it comes to distillers that a lot of the time the people that make the actual spirit themselves aren't around when the spirit's released because so much time goes past between the production to the release of it and so you don't know you've got a cracker of a vintage so to speak until 10 15 20 years later and you then go back and try and replicate what was happening then yeah and that's why, I mean, there's certain vintages, of course, in a lot of Isla whiskey, uh, and especially from distilleries like Laphroaig, like Bamore, like Ardbeg, there, where there's a certain sort of numbers that are lusted after. And if you know, if you if you say it to any Ardbeg fan, you say 1974, it's like that magic year for them. It's like, oh, 74 Ardbeg. And you could say oh, yeah. the same about Bamore with 1964, 1965, that era. You have Bamore the almond in 2005. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so um uh there's a comment from bob wenting all the way from europe uh, uh saying uh in the old days there was no coal in spaceside guess how they dried the malt there you go pete and wood fire as he says um yeah, yeah i so still peat that's just tiny well yeah no but he's talking about in the old days he said in the old days how would they they, they weren't using coal that's for sure uh, Jeremy Young joined. Good to see you, Jeremy, all the way from Lark. Good to see you, mate. David Taylor, good to see you, mate. Hope you're all well. Hey, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, cool. Um, big shout out, Jeremy. Um, yeah, cool. So there's that. So that that I guess uh, that in that respect, then if we're uh, just on the actual sort of technicality of vintages, what's your take then on sort of uh, well, I know they've just recently changed it, but something like a Glen Rothy's model where it's it was it was vintages on the bottles rather than age statements. Yeah, and, and as, as you said, they have just changed that. And that's something a couple other distilleries were were doing for a bit. Glenn, Glenn Tarrant did it for a while, or a few others that did it for a little while here and there. Glenn Rothers would be the really good representation of vintages. Uh, like, yeah. Again, potentially Glenn the same marketing thing that we saw in terms when it comes to age statements. Um, vintages is something that, uh, like, it works great independent bottling so you can see a snapshot in time yeah I think when you're looking at core releases it's it gets a bit wishy-washy for me anyway uh the difference between an indie release is it's one single cast or one single distillery from one single time it gives you a snapshot that's something different to what that series normally releases when they decide their core range so to speak is vintages uh interesting it's, it's not how i'd go about doing it though no because it, it doesn't create any consistency for on the consumer end either it, it doesn't sort of it's, you, you're, you're creating a snapshot of what that whiskey tasted like in that year and it's uh, if it's if it said 2000 on the bottle then you're looking at a 20 year old whiskey this year but if it says 2000 next year it's 21 year old and it's well yeah. it, it gives you an excuse to be inconsistent <laughs> uh, wink wink nudge nudge um <laughs> But um, yeah, love you, Edrington. Love you to bits, guys. Okay, so yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, <laughs> uh, Jeremy oh, says no, no, all no, the good people. The, the whiskey from that story, I absolutely love as well, but it's just not how I'd go about marketing it. Uh, but again, it's the same hole you can get into with age statements that you expect in Lafroy 10 year old to taste like Lafroy 10 year old every single year. Well, we would say yes, but we can prove that by tasting a early 2000s Lafroy 10 and early 90s Lafroy 10 and early 80s Lafroy 10. They are all going to taste different. See, the changes that we've seen in distilleries over the years, now some of the big ones, of course, moving from coal to direct heat sources, uh, using air, going from air dried to um, heat dried staves, going from things like that, like some of the big production changes that we've seen, which are methods of efficiency or emissions or whatever. Um, Especially going Brewers barley to distillers barley. Yeah, brewers to distillers barley, and like you know, finding the highest yield barley and finding the, the easiest to work with yeast strains and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think personally, and again, subjectivity plays a huge part in this, but I think it's actually improved a lot of Isla whiskey. If we're talking Isla, I mean, I I think that there's certain just certain whiskies like 
Uh, maybe not improved it, but it certainly changed it for the better. Uh, and I, I've, cons- I've consistently said that core range Isla whiskeys like Laphroaig 10, like Ardbeg 10, uh, Bamore 10 have actually consistently been getting better. Yeah, I'm going to jump in quickly and then I know Joey's going to jump in and talk about the life of, of Kilhoman and how that's gone from 2005 to today. Um, but I, I've seen both ends of this. Like, yeah, no, absolutely. At- I've seen both ends of it, but I think in some cases it actually has improved. Yeah, yeah. So if I look at, say, uh, Lefroy 10-year-old, if I look at the cast rate releases, the mm. first cast rate release of 10-year-old was phenomenal. Mm. Now, I, I think Lefroy cast strength is probably one of the best standard releases they do. I just wish they would release it more than just at the distillery. I, I think it's the best value for money. I think it's like 30 pounds or something like that at the distillery. It's amazing. But the first release of it was phenomenal. Every release since has been good, but never been quite as good. Mm. If I then look at the fashion releases with Karchus, last year's Karchus release, in my mind, was the best Karchus release they've done. So whether it's about getting the casting right or whether the, the distillate has changed, don't know. It's under different regimes, I guess. Uh, yeah, Joey. I'm, I'm no, sure, sorry. Sure Kilhoman has changed from the start to today. No, I just, I just, you just mentioned it, so I've got one sitting here. Uh, oh, didn't open tonight, but that's the the ten car strength. Um, Ooh, I love that. That is one of the best. Batch ten. Batch ten. So not batch one. I'm sorry. Batch one had a green stripe, if I recall. Yes. Yes, but that was um, yeah, batch ten, a more recent one. But there you go. Uh, uh, Jose from Casa de Vinos is currently, uh, he's missing one from the collection and I'm pretty sure he has it arriving the next couple of months. And when he does, he's doing a 10 releases of Cast Strength 10. Um, oh, yeah, so very cool. before we on, on this topic, I'm a bit confused about vintages. Sorry, Joe, you're going to talk about Kill Homan in this regard. About whether it's gotten um, better or, or whether the older releases were better. Well, it's not better or not. Well, they only started 2005. And then the thing is, they wanted to, you know, represent the traditional of um, Isla, like Scottish whiskey, farmer make the whiskey. So they are actually working very hard to yield much more the rockside barley, which is their own home grow barley to make the uh, orange. But then they still actually, at the moment, still importing some of the Port Allen motor barley. So they're still like heavily peated from Port Allen and then added to Kilhoman. Mm. But what I'm trying to say is, this is not just a, a stage of represent what they try to do. Like, you know, they get consulted by Dr. James Wong, one of the genius whiskey expert in the whole whiskey world. The first person created the whiskey flavor wheel, you know, to yep. create a, 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 a distillation for particular what, whiskey Anthony Will and the family wanted to create. So what I try to say is between vintages, traditional Scottish making whiskey and nowadays what distilleries from Scotland are making their whiskey is, you know, you get a huge gap, but people are taking the traditional method and try to do modernization. For example, Balvini, Glamorangie, they are probably the first two people I ever know that they have worked with and play with different cask combination to mature the whiskey, you know. And for um, Kilhoman, they are the very first Isla single malt, single farm barley distillery to create this phenomenal whiskey and showing people young ages is not a problem. It's mm-hmm. more about the flavor until now none of the bottle will be putting a number of the age, but then they still very transparent about, okay, these batches is distilled 2006, bottled 2012. You know what I mean? I wanted to send a message is like, as a consumer, you have to, you know, if you willing to spend your money on whiskey, you're gonna have to dig in. You have to know where the whiskey come from, what you actually really like, and all that stuff and people like us that work for the brand in the past or like we, we love the whiskey we get connection we have to help out that so i can't say hey you know this is what people are doing this day or this is what people are doing in that particular region mm. i think all of us have to chip in and learn more about it and respect and appreciate the hard work because 
I know there's a lot of people with big money who buy Jesus Christ from auction, like the most rare whiskey from 30 years old, space like, you know, Glenfiddich, whatever. And then they just sit there in the cabinet and don't know shit about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you can easily to support the other distillery about learning what is it make of and learn about it. And you get the money to buy those bottles, travel over there, not now, but like later. To learn yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I mean is just, you have to be transparent as the producer and like, just, it's not one or the other. This is everyone doing different things. You know, it's not one or better than the others. That's what I try to say. Oh, I get it. Um, I get it. I get it. And, and, and you actually, you, yeah. also, you reminded me that um, we had a, our live stream last night was with, um, was live from Isla with uh, Chloe Wood. And, um, and uh, she was, She's uh, the Asia Pacific brand ambassador for Brook Laddie. And um, we, were, we were talking about um, one of the great questions that came up is the, is the Eastern side of Isla and their production different from the Western side? And, and I thought that's actually a really good question. It was kind of like, because in, in some respects, as, as came up in the chat, uh, the, the, the likes of Kill Hyman and Brook Laddie next to order each other, they sort of... Um, they can sort of also, they seem to be able to produce a younger, more vibrant malt than some of the more old school producers, uh, like the, your Bamors and your Ardbegs of the world, which are, which have a, a much more sort of a storied history, of course. But, um, yeah. yeah. Also, you've got to remember if you're a distillery next to another distillery, good chance your workforce is sharing knowledge, a good fancy workforce is sharing jobs from one yeah. to the other. So, it, your style of spirit is, is, it's not surprising it might become somewhat similar when you're going to be sharing. The same employees, the same knowledge amongst each other. I'm uh, guessing some of that knowledge is um, shared over at. Um, I'm guessing some of that knowledge might be shared at the Lockendale Hotel on a, on a Friday afternoon. So yeah, exactly, <laughs> <laughs> whether they'll meet you or not after a few too many drinks. Uh, talking about Arlo, we've now moved on to twenty nine dot two seventy eight year old second fill ex bourbon barrel. The name on that one, carrying on with the fascials, is called Collateral Dramage. Oh, brilliant. So that's that's the name on it. Yeah. Sanjava. The collateral drummer is the peated eight-year-old whiskey. You know what? We don't see, uh, society members will know, we don't see an awful lot of young spirit out of 29. Uh, we get a lot of we get a lot of 18, 19, 20, 25-year-old casts, which are great, and they have a certain uh, elegance and um, and like sort of elegance and I guess is one word for it, but like a, a lovely sort of sugary smoke to some of those older ones that we get, like the one I was just dreaming on, 29.2, yeah. three per minute. And when you, do get, when you do get older 29, it does bring out a lot of lemon, pear, those fruit sort of things you wouldn't expect with this distillery. But when it is younger, it's young just one. A, yeah. Yeah. It, it's so much more fun. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That The young one is just the, the younger ones that we see out of that distillery. And age is quite young because like we don't, we haven't seen a young uh, 29 in some time, actually, more than a year. Uh, so that's always very exciting to see that. And so, how's that one traveling? Oh, it is. Uh, it's delightful, actually. It, and, and it's and it's it doesn't taste youthful either. It's still got a lot going on, which is good. Second fill uh, barrel. Yep. Keep keep keeping on the subject of potentially Isla, but also looking at the rest of Scotland. One thing I'm interested in when it comes to vintages and and how distilleries change over time is what's going to be happening with these distilleries that are about to come back online. So looking at Port Ellen looking at Brora, Rosebank. Well, that, uh, that's huge. I mean, there's all these old brands that, have, um, that are, are reviving uh, yeah, and they're all, and they're all the, the mega ones as well. They're all like the, the cult-like brands of Brora and uh, Port Ellen, Rosebank, as you said. It, it's, yeah. yeah and, and I'm really curious because, like, obviously there's a lot of uh, cult status for something like Port Ellen. Yeah. And... In my mind, when we're looking at vintages of Port Ellen, some of the 13-year-old was released like a decade ago. I thought it was amazing. Some of the stuff we're seeing these days, it's interesting and unique to try, but I think younger Port Ellen was better. It just still has this cult status. So people are still getting enamored with the Port Ellen's coming out. Is Port Ellen going to be living up to that hype that is so much expected about it? And when you look at something like a Port Ellen compared to a Brora, when Brora shut down, they just turned the lights off and walked out. That yeah. still is still there. Yeah. They, they, I shouldn't do some minor maintenance to it, but effectively, it's all still there. Port Ellen, none of it's there. Like the, distil the yeah. stills are being scrapped, the building's gone. They're building a whole new still and distillery from scratch. 
how are you going to recreate that famed spirit, so to speak? Well, the, the, to answer your first point, of, or answer that point, I don't think they need to. Uh, I think the hype will, be, will, will carry that along just fine. Um, but in terms of, uh, I don't even know if they'll need to recreate that sort of, that um, same level of spirit. But uh, what I will say is that we had a couple of uh, 43s through the society uh, over the years, uh, which were, came from a distillery that starts with port. Uh, and they were, um, they, we, 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 I remember trying one courtesy of our cellar master and it was 43.3 was the code on it. And it was a 12 year old single cask uh, Port Ellen. And it's yeah, like, yeah. The, the, as you just said, the younger age stuff that I've tried versus some of the 30, 27, 30, 33 year old casks ha- have been phenomenal. Yeah, like the, some, some of those Indies of Port Ellen that still float around that are at that age, I reckon it's the, the, the peak for Port Ellen if you're looking at that spirit to glorify what we think Port Ellen is. Yeah. Uh, it's I've gotten to the point where, again, getting those age statements, is a 34 year old Port Ellen better than a 13? Because it's older, well, in my mind, no. I yeah. think that is did better at that twelve-year-old age, but it's it's pretty stock standard that an Isle of Surrey smoky whiskey does better at that ten to fifteen range generally, because you still get smoke, you still get distillery characteristics. The cask hasn't taken over too much. Yeah, there's a um, well, the, the big question as well with the distillery like Port Ellen is coming uh, coming back online, especially if I'm I know I'm focusing on that one, but if you look at um, okay. I'm going to just put some context into this. If you look at a distillery like Elsa Bay, that is, in my opinion, well, I know it's opinion, and James is probably going to kick me for this, but um, yeah. we, we Jimmy, yeah, we Jimmy is going to give me a, a boot yeah, up the bumper. Yeah, we all miss you, Jimmy. Um, uh, no, it's not a distillery. It's it's a it's a replication facility. They can produce any style of malt across any style or any across any flavor they want. Uh, and I, 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 my, one of my favorite stories was when uh, uh, I'm going to get this wrong. So no, I'm, I'm going to leave that one, but I'll come back. <laughs> but it was, um, uh, it was uh, David. No, it was David Stewart at Balvenie who was at a, a test tasting of Elsa Bay's malts um, about a year ago. It would have been more than a year ago. And um, this was just before 1.1 came out, like the Pete Smoke series came out and all that kind of thing. And he, they, they passed him a, a whiskey and it was part of a William Grant's round table sort of session. And um, he nosed it and tasted it. This is David Stewart, the malt master at Balvenie and said, well, that's Balvenie 12 Doublewood. I know that I'd know that one from anywhere. And he, they said, no, that's a three-year-old Elsa Bay. And <laughs> yeah, so well. it's, they've replicated the flavor. Actually, actually that does remind me, because if you want to talk about spirits changing, throughout time yeah. One, yeah. That, that one that we got, which is a big one which i don't know how much my bosses might want me saying this but lafroy 10 has changed a lot oh a lot uh, yeah yeah now a big part of that would be the fact that it's now exclusively aged in x makers mark barrels where it's always been aged in bourbon cast but then now like for the last 10 years i think it's been it's been exclusive makers mark scales barrels and i don't know how much that's affected the spirit i don't know whether the malting regimes changed their own uh, the own malting they do, how much that might have changed. But I do know at a recent dish tasting that uh, Lachlan Watt and Yao were both at, which uh, Lafroy 10 was in, they both picked it as a Hi, vanilla. Yeah, right. And then he asked you, did they change it? Yeah, so like, as, again, this is that marketing, like we never change things, but obviously stuff gets changed. Uh, it always- the fact that both Lachlan and Yao, who have great palates, Yep. Uh, pick three tenders of more in a blind tasting kind of suggests that maybe things have changed. Uh, has it changed for the better or the worse? Well, that's personal preference. That's personal preference. But my, my point following on from that, the Elsa Bay comment was that maybe with the amount of um, technology now coming into how a distillery operates rather than just efficiencies, we're now looking at technologies of how they can you know replicate certain styles and how they can use all sorts of technologies from blockchain to whatnot to, to, for production. Do you think that we're going to start seeing maybe distilleries like the new Port Ellen being able to replicate the old style. Yeah. And, and also, um, is, is there a distillery around Tassie or something that's like been artificially aging whiskey? I saw some article yeah, recently deep, about that. Deep, deviant distillery. Yeah. Yeah. So if we add the ability to have a distillery like in Alsa Bay, even like um, your Loch Lomond that has 
the vast range of, of still types to be able to replicate a bunch of things and then add in some artificial aging to that. What does the future of uh, whiskeys look like? Yeah, well, I'm one of those people that I'm fairly old school in my approach is in that I think that you can't cheat the aging process. Like you can't cheat time in a cask. Um, and I know there's people that try and I've heard of supersonic aging this and and uh, all this. Oh, yeah, no, not all this supersonic. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sorry. sorry for supersonic but no sorry supersonic <laughs> lovers it doesn't work <laughs> uh, you can do it for cocktails but not whiskey yeah yeah no i get that yeah, yeah. Uh, okay <laughs> well on, that, yeah. well okay maybe yeah okay but um no look yeah I think in terms of I think we've covered a lot in terms of vintages here. It's, there's 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 a lot to chew through there, and there's a lot sort of we could. This could probably be even a three part. Do you guys want to come back on? We should do another one. Sure. We'd always love to. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. First of all, I just love seeing your pretty face. Ah. Uh, <laughs> you're love welcome back. Your back time. <laughs> and you know the two of us, we can talk whiskey for hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it is a fascinating discussion to see how whiskies have changed uh, over the years, uh, what those vintages mean, and how and how we approach them as as consumers is always very fascinating. And and especially as this new world comes on, uh, in terms of as you said, res, resurgence. Uh, a, a good one just to touch on as well. What you said before, Tom. What is brewer going to look like? What's modern yeah. brewer going to taste like? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. But yeah, like, is it going to be anything like Brewer? What was the Peter version Peter of Brewer again? Uh, it wasn't very high. It was like 35 ppm or something. I don't, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but it's not very high. Also, I'm, I'm curious to look at these dudes. Like, um, if, we, if we want to talk about vintages, uh, Joey and I tried an amazing Convo Moore uh, last year that was my pick of whiskeys of the year. It didn't come out last year. It was from 93, from memory. Yep. It's a 93 Convo Moore. Yes. Yep. And it was... In my opinion, my favorite whiskey that I tried last year, it was phenomenal. Yet that's a distillery. There's no chat about getting back online. No. So every whiskey I've tried has been brilliant. So. Well, yeah, that's enough also people my, start talking about Tumble more. Yeah. Yeah, that's also my, um, you know, content about today. Like, you know, people our age or younger can able to have a chance to try the vintage whiskey like Covermore, Close Distillery, like 1977 or like 1984, you know, will bring a different perspective of what they look at for single malt whiskey, you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. There's, so there's like, a couple of, couple of comments I'll just jump in here with um, for us all to chew on. Uh, Andy says, in my opinion, distillate is always the key. Traditional method producing distillery uh, not necessarily creates a better product. That's also, that's a good take actually. So, um, a, a, so saying a traditional spirit m making distillery is not necessarily a better product. So floor maltings and uh, low yeah. yield barley and all those kind of things. Yeah, uh, of course. There, there, there's lots of areas where you go wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lots of various ways. Exactly, exactly. And the more variables you bring into yeah. it, the more likelihood of error. But um, he's uh, not wrong. Um, Jeremy Young from Lark says, uh, "Wood chips plus new make in a vat?" Question mark. Yeah. <laughs> And then he yeah. replied to himself and said, no. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah. Uh, and then Yao says, a style of cask available, what blends needed at the time, et cetera. That's a really good point from Yao, actually. He says, uh, the style of casks available and what blends were needed at the time. Because as we know, uh, a, a lot of these distilleries, like the Port Ellens and Brewers and stuff, were pretty much supplying exclusively to blends. And so mm -hmm. it was what those blends needed. And, of course, blended whiskey was even bigger then than it is now in terms of actual market share, not in terms of consumption, but yep. Yeah, yeah because you, look, you look at, say, Brunhaven, and that was just a behemoth of distillery from the Victorian age just to facilitate blends. Oh, yeah. It just happens that the one of the most ugliest distilleries <laughs> that's just like a factory going on just produces some awesome single malts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and Ardmore is the same case. Like uh, Ardmore didn't release a single malt whiskey until I think it was about 2012 but they've been making whiskey for over 100 years. It's just, it's all been for blended. Well, actually, if I'm, if I'm just to throw one piece of very cool society history in there, the first Ardmore single malts were society casks. Yeah, nice. There you go. And, this, and by the way, it's the same for Brewer. So yeah, right. Brewer was a single malt 
at bef- through us before it was a single malt, which was very cool. So that was that sort of some of that some of the history of the society. I love that we were, and same for Glenrothes, same for a few distilleries actually that were we we were the first to bottle their spirit as single malts before they did, because uh, they was, they were was, just for blending. They were just blenders. It, it, it's the case of pretty much every single malt distillery within Scotland has been around for long enough. Start off as independence was the only way you could get any of their juice for so yep. long because. As you've already mentioned, blend was the standard and almost still is the standard for the majority of the world. Oh, no, it still is. It's still 80-something percent. What was that, Joey? Yeah, I have a question for you. So- oh, I'm getting interviewed now. Here we go. Go. Come on. You, come you on. Come on. Ah, come on. Go for it. Um, which country is the highest consume of SMWS volume? Oh, no, it has to. It's definitely. Oh. No, it has to, in terms of actual volume, it'd have to be the UK. I mean, that's where the vaults were founded. That's where the, the most of the members are. Um, the most of the members are? Yeah, most members are in the UK, are like uh, Scotland or um, England. Okay, how much is in Scotland and how much in Australia compare? Oh, I mean, we're, we're quite small compared to the Scottish branch, I'll have to, be, I'll have to admit. Um, but but we're, we're not growing. Like, we're, we're ever growing. We are growing quite quickly, actually. We're... Uh, it's always great having new members join up and um, just a cheeky little plug. If you're watching on YouTube, you can always hit the membership link below or if you're, um, if you're on yeah, Facebook. Well, have, yeah. <laughs> but there you go. But like it, it, um, we are still the, um, we're the third biggest branch still, I think. So, um, which is all very cool because it's UK, US, then us. And it, it, we've got a very active branch here in Australia, as you guys know, and you see. And um, no, I, I appreciate the question though. That's that's a good one. I am. Um, uh- just like like planning it for you. I've, I've been calling uh, here that celebrated. Uh, bring that a bit closer. Bring that a bit closer. I'm going to highlight your screen for a second here. Oh, guys, here we go. Seventy three point eight three Anzac biscuits and cricket bats. A fifteen year old spicy and dry celebrating fifteen years of the SMWS in Australia. Yeah, very cool. I, I know one that, that that's that's a gem for future times. Yeah, yeah, that was a that was obviously you know that whiskey because you were at Whiskey and Helmet when that came out. Yeah, and I've drunk probably about four or five bottles of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's more than I have. <laughs> he he open that for you. Oh, what a yeah, guy. Especially when I found out that Archie Rose had about three or four bottles of it. Every time I was there, especially with Lockie, uh, yeah. the first thing was go to Archie Rose from the airport and drink an, an amount of drams. Of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is very cool. <laughs> um <laughs> that is very cool. And I'm guessing you also, did you grab any of those 68.18s? The, the, oh, just okay. within within arm's reach. Look at that. You guys, uh, there we go. The uh, Triple Berry Lamington Cake, another special release exclusive to Whiskey and Almond. See, I reckon both those whiskeys are very cool sort of pieces of history for the for the club. But I reckon the uh, the 68.18 is even more poignant in your case because you're, you're a part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I helped select that barrel. Exactly. Awesome. Um, there was a uh, comment here from Andy Chu. He says, uh, Brewer, the first Brewer Society Brewer 61.1, it was 31 pounds a bottle when it came out. So, um, I hate you so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it would have been a lot for a single malt that no one had ever heard of when you think about it. It's sort of been like, uh, who's ever heard of Brewer? And so, yeah, it's that's a that's that's very cool, Andy. It's that's a very cool piece of history right there. And it, I, I, I hate you if you bought one for 31 pounds. But um, <laughs> uh, like, like to, to be honest, uh, the the amount of whiskeys I've had in my collection that I bought for pets that I wish I still had and could buy a house with now. But at the end of the day, uh, whiskey's always meant for dris- uh, for drinking. And during this downtime, I've been doing like a bit of whiskey research because what else am I going to do? And uh, there was a video I was watching recently, and it had one of the master slitters from uh, Buffalo Trace, and he was talking about when his father released the six millionth barrel of Buffalo Trace, Pappy gave him a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle, 23 year old, a special lease. And went, here you go, here's, here's a, uh, you know, a, a gift for you. Congratulations for releasing your six millionth barrel. He cracked it open, poured a little bit out for his dad, a little bit out for his brother, a little bit out for himself. When he went to go put the cork back on, his dad went, what the hell are you doing? It's like, what do you mean? Like, uh, it's a pretty rare, bottling i want to be able to save this have toast further on his, and his dad just went no no we're the fragile part of this piece there's always going to be more rare whiskeys to drink we won't always be around though so in, in that vein I've, I've always had the same opinion but yeah that's very cool that's a very good way of looking at it that 
the people you share it with is the is the fragile part of it. That's that's the bit that you'll never get to appreciate again. That's because that though, as you as you all know, if you're you know you're at whiskey festivals, you're at events, you're at tastings, you're with friends, family, loved ones, like sharing that with them in that moment is is far more important than holding onto something that you is always you know you're going to keep keep the foil on. Yeah, exactly. And 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 so when we're looking at vintage drams, yeah, there are some amazing vintage drams to try that throughout the time. But I would never want to sit there and try and recreate that vintage dram. I want to recreate the moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much to both of you for tuning in tonight. Uh, we'll call it a night there. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your Tuesday night to do a live stream with SMWS and all of its members and everyone who tuned in. Thank you to everyone who tuned in on Facebook, Facebook page, group, uh, YouTube. Of course, this will be up on YouTube as a more permanent video within the next five to six hours. And then after that, uh, of course, it'll always be on our Facebook group. So you guys are immortalized. Everything you said's on camera. You're done. You're, you're, um, and <laughs> can't get out of that. <laughs> but, um, Matt, again, thank, thank you very much for having us. No, thank you so much for being a part of it tonight. And, um, just a quick little, re uh, quick little, um, update for everyone who's tuned, who's still watching near the end here. Um, tomorrow night is, of course, Whiskey Roundtable. Uh, and then, uh, Thursday night is live with Alexandra Dahlenberg. And Friday night is Friday drinks Q and A. Join in on Zoom. Bring bring a bottle. Come come along digitally at the very least. Uh, Tom, Joey, thank you so much for um again for tonight, and we'll catch you all you, tomorrow night, folks. I love the microphone. It looks so professional. And and the and the and the and the closeout music. Cheers, guys. Slancha. <laughs> Slancha.